Next, I'd like to welcome already to the stage, Craig Bunce. He's the State of Utah Geospatial Data Coordinator, and I'm going to pull up his presentation. You're on. All right, well, I'm up on the stage already because I think I've got 15 minutes. I tend to be long-winded, so I'm going to move a little fast here, um, but I got a lot of stuff to say. But yeah, welcome to Salt Lake City, everyone. Um, how many folks, this is your first time visiting Salt Lake City? Okay, so not a, not a huge number, but a good number. Um, I'm Greg Bunce. I am the geospatial data coordinator here at the UGRC, which is Utah's uh, Utah Geospatial Resource Center. We did switch our name recently, so it's a little bit of a mouthful. We're still working, but UGRC for sure. But um, I'm going to give you some contextual information here for the next 15 minutes to kind of orient you into Salt Lake City, Utah, the GIS uh, community here, and uh, just kind of give you a quick welcome in. So we'll move fast, but hopefully it'll be entertaining. Okay, perfect. So if you were sitting in these seats uh, 18,000 years ago, you'd be sitting under 200 feet of water. So at that point in time, what was present here in the valley and throughout much of the region was Lake Bonneville. Um, you can see on the map on the right, this is a massive lake, right? This, at, at its deepest point, was 900 feet deep. And it went all the way up into Idaho, over into Nevada. You can see in the middle map here, this is the Salt Lake Valley. It was mostly you know, underwater. And then where we're sitting right now, a couple of yards probably, well, a few yards from the shoreline here. So this map really is showing you the difference between um, the Great Salt Lake now, the darker the map here, and then the, the Lake Bonneville one. So quite a bit difference. You can almost think of the, the Great Salt Lake as what's left of Lake Bonneville. There's a really cool video. I don't have time to play it here, but uh, you should check this out. I think I linked it in the app. Uh, this, this is a screenshot from it. As you can watch, um, the lake is filling up over time, and it just, it's about a couple minutes long. Definitely, if you're interested in this stuff, definitely take the time to check out this video. And, and the video will go on, and you'll see that all the buildings are fully submerged. So if you've seen the U sign up on the hill, somewhere I think in that direction, and you're trying to look for shorelines, that is your indication you're looking too high. So the U sign was above the lake level. At, um, and then you have these shorelines, right? So there were multiple different lake levels for, the, for this lake as it went over, up and down over time. But the Bonneville one is the one we're talking about here. And as you think about it, as this lake is there, it's, it's kind of churning into the sides of the mountains and it's leaving a bench or a, or a flat area. Um, and the one that you can see, depending, it's like sun, sun or like early in the morning or later in the evening, if you look right, you kind of see these bench marks. That would be the Bonneville shoreline. And then you could see the temple and, uh, the, the capital and everything that, that's well underwater. So it's tempting, right? There's benches along the, all along the valley here. It's tempting to build homes on these, which has been done, as you can see. So you can see in this one photo, along where it says Bonneville Shoreline, these are homes that are built out along the shoreline bench. And then really, this is built on sand and gravel. Unfortunately, when we have a wet year like we did last year, so if you're following the news, if you're a skier, you know that we got hit pretty good in the 2022-23 uh, season for snow. It was a phenomenal year for snow. This was an unfortunate situation, though. So these homes that are up on these benches, again, are sitting on gravel. The ground saturates with all this moisture, and the ground can't hold this. Fortunately, this home was uh, condemned. They knew this was basically happening. There's a video, if you Google Draper house collapse, um, you can see it. The folks across the street just basically grabbed their cameras and said, there it's going, it's going, it's going, and it, and it went. But, so no one was hurt in this incident, but, uh, but interesting enough. The other thing you're going to notice, and you'll hear you know, from fo folks coming in for the first time, is what's up with the wide streets? You guys have such wide streets here. Well, let's address that. So they're precisely 132 feet wide, which is very wide. This is a street, uh, this is a corridor heading downtown. This is State Street. You know, it's a six-lane highway running through our downtown here. The blocks are also very large. They're 660 foot wide blocks. That's the length of two football fields. I know Maggie experienced that. I think she was trying to get from one point to one point recently and thought she could walk a few blocks, but ended up realizing, whoa, these blocks are big blocks. Um, by comparison, Portland, you know, they're 200 by 200 feet, and the, the road there is about, the road width there is probably about 40 to 50 feet wide. 
So why? Why do we have this, right? So it really dates back to the 1947 and the Mormon pioneers. And by the way, I'm going to be using the term Mormon, but the current day terminology is members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm using Mormon here because I'm referring contextually to a time in history when this was commonplace to use that term. So Mormon pioneers, they're coming across the country, and they're being persecuted in Illinois, and they're, they're coming here to land in the Great Salt Lake Valley. This is, this is the place of refuge. And with them, you know, they're pushing handcarts, and they're carrying documents as well. At the time, I should mention, this was Mexican territory. One of the documents that they're carrying is this thing called the Platte for the City of Zion, or the Platte of Zion. And it was created in 1833 by the founder of the church, which is Joseph Smith. And this plat kind of lays out this idyllic city. Uh, the temple is at the center, and then it's very orthogonal, and it radiates out from there. This is probably a depiction of what that would look like, what the early community looked like here. So up in the, up in the upper left-hand side, you've got the tabernacle or the temple would be at the center, and then you'd have these brick and stone homes that are radiating out from, um, from there, and then you'd ha they'd be spaced out wide enough so if a home caught fire, it wouldn't, it wouldn't spread to the next home. And then very large backyards. You'd have fruit trees and, and uh, gardens, and then farming would be on the outside. Because you've got to remember, they're arriving here with the notion of staying. They're not here to mine. They're not here to get in and get out. They're here to stay and build a community. So the streets. So Brigham Young is the one who led them across the country. Joseph Smith um, was killed in Nauvoo. So Brigham Young was the one who brings them out, and he's, he's leading them here, and he starts like, laying out the city. And it's said that he's, it, it, is, it is said that he has said that the streets of Salt Lake should be made sufficiently wide so that a wagon team could turn around without resorting to profanity. So whether that's a joke or not, that's, 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 that's the reason for it. So really, you know, you should be able to turn a wagon around in the streets. So this, these streets can be a bit hostile to pedestrians. However, if you use them correctly, um, you can get a little creative and do, do nice things. So this is Main Street, one street over from the one I showed before. Now we have light rail running down the, 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 the main street here. Um, it breaks it up a little more, a little more pedestrian friendly. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. There's just tree lines, so you, so you can be creative and use the streets. Okay, the unique addressing. It looked like a lot of folks were here last night. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it, but I think that's another thing. When you first see Utah addressing, you say, what is going on here? I know when I first moved here, I sent my address back home and they said, I think you gave me the wrong address. I said, nope, I gave you the right address. But, when you, but as mappers, when you get accustomed to this addressing system, there is no better addressing system, honestly. It has a geographic component to it, and when it clicks, it's like, this, this makes sense. I wish everyone would use this. So you have the coordinate system, is the, it's a, basically a coordinate system, and you have in the center is zero, zero. It tends to be the temple. Each community around town has a, has a coordinate system. That's the origin. Then the streets go 100 north, 200 north, south is 100 south, 200 south, 100 at east, 100... 200 east, you get the idea. They go out in 100 blocks radiating from the center. So you get these quadrants. So in the upper right-hand corner here, we have an address of 300 north, 200 east. You, you already know when you hear that address that you're in the northwest quadrant, you're northwest of the temple, and you're about three blocks north and two blocks east. So once that kind of clicks, you can be given an address at any point in the system and say, yeah, I know where I'm going, I know what direction I'm going in. Yeah, what did I say? Northwest. Northeast quadrant, thank you. See, that's why it's so confusing. <laughs> Take all of this with a grain of salt. This slide I'm not going to get into too much, but we in the West here, we have the, uh, the Public Land Survey System, or the PLSS. It really governs a lot of the development out here. So you have these orthogonal grids all over. There's you know, one mile by one mile sections. Um, if you're a surveyor, there is the monument down by the temple. Uh, you can see pointed out here uh, where, is, where that's the center for the Salt Lake Meridian. Um, and then each surveying system has a different meridian. So it's surveyors, this might be somewhat interesting to you. If you're interested in surveying and the grid and a lot of the things I just talked about, there's a blog post I wrote called The Western Grid Explained. You should check it out. It talks a little bit about the Gunter chain and surveying and why there's so much divisible with 66 feet and why, you know, it explains a lot of the Western patterns. All right, one of the last things historically I was going to talk about is Fort Douglas. So that's where we're sitting right now. So 1862, the Civil War is going on. It looks like I've got five minutes left. Um, 1862, the Civil War is going on, and you know, there's secessionist activity going on in the South. 
Um, there's new settlement here in the Utah Territory, and there's suspicion that there's secessionist activity going on here with the pioneers. So the, the government decides to set up a fort up here on a hill. You know, if you didn't have the University of Utah here, you'd be looking over a broad valley, and you could see everything that's going on. And then you've got the overland mail route that's coming out of the Immigration Canyon here and, and going through the valley. So, so th this was established to uh, really kind of keep an eye on those things. And if, you're, if you have time, you can walk over. You can see some of the buildings. This is Officer Circle here. Um, just kind of a fun historical aspect of our location. It, it turned over to the University of Utah in the early 90s, and in 2002 when the Olympics were here, this, one, one of the first uses of this space was to host uh, the, uh, the athletes up here. So this is our new flag. We're pretty proud of it. Um, it was passed by the legislature in 2023 last year. We had an old flag before that, was, which was more of the seal on a bed sheet or the SOB. We moved past that, and we have a nice, we have a nice flag now. One of the things I wanted to point out is we have the beehive. And this was on the old flag, this is on the new flag, because it's really representative of who we are here in Utah. Uh, we worked together, again, as, you know, as, these, as the community came down and descended on this valley, it was, it's, let's work together, let's make this work. Um, we're known as the busy bees because of that. And my office, the Utah Geospatial Resource Center, UGRC, we also embody this spirit, and most, uh, most folks here in Utah do, is that we're gonna work together and we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this right. So in 1970s, our office dates back to then because there's some discussion along different state agencies about, hey, we're, we're, let's start doing GIS and do mapping data. Well, they said, well, let's work together. Let's, maybe let's create an office so whatever you're doing your different agencies, we could bring it under one umbrella. 1981 comes along and our office is established, which is pretty early in, in terms of uh, geospatial offices nation, nationwide. 1991, there's some legislation that's passed that says, okay, there will be a state geographic information database, or SGID, and our office is to maintain and host that. Um, it was a database at that time. At this point, we think of it more of a data source because uh, it's a little more decentralized, and you know, web services and such. But that was established in 1991, so this thing has been around for a while. There's a lot of data in this data source, uh, most of it authoritative. And again, you know, back to the bees. It's, it's, you got, we got federal partners working in there, state agencies, cities and towns, uh, M, um, MPOs, and then UGRC. We have a clearinghouse for it, opendata.gis.utah.gov. You can go in and you can either search for different layers or you can browse for certain layers. This is a great resource for open street mappers to kind of verify things, check it out. We also have a web application, much, much like OpenStreetMap.org, where if you don't really want to go look at data specifically, you can check out this uh, application where it's contextual, so you can click on the map. It'll give you some information, such as elevation, approximate address, and other information on where you are. So just wanted to point that out because I think it's, it's a good source when you're mapping if you want to verify um, things against the data that we have in there. Last thing I wanted to point out about the SGID is um, is that you know, we, we put a lot of energy into making this correct and keeping it accurate because it's used for the ballots that we process here. And you know, if you get a, a ballot in, in Utah, it's coming from data from there. If you call 911 right now, the data on the back end from our office is gonna route the call to the nearest dispatch center. It's for taxation purposes, transportation. So this data is used in a lot of uh, government business systems. But as I said, there's a lot of data in this database or in this data source and one of the things that is we've noticed is some of the data in here is not really getting as much attention as it should. If you think about address points, parcels, roads, this is getting a lot of attention. It's authoritative data coming from authoritative sources, and we have update schedules and cycles. However, you get into like recreation categories um, and society categories, and some of this data gets a little bit out of date. So this is where we're trying to work to move this data to OpenStreetMap, and we've been working a bit with Martine and his Map Roulette uh, project with trailheads. We have 700 trailheads. We want to move them over to OpenStreetMap, and this is a process we're working on right now. Once they're there, we can pull them from, we can edit there. All stewards and folks who are use, um, editing for trailheads would do it in OpenStreetMap, and then we would pull it down into the SGID, and we can serve it as a web service there. We've done that with common places. This is how we're sourcing common places now. Um, just because you, you all have done a fantastic job and we try to contribute to, to, to say let's, let's host, let's maintain that layer there and we can pull it into our business system such as the 911 dispatch centers from OpenStreetMap. These are some of the other layers that we, we thought you know, are great possibilities to do that with. 
So uh, probably the last slide here is, this is kind of the data, uh, data workflow for the SGID. Oftentimes it starts at the locals. Um, this is a county, a city, an MPO, and then we aggregate that up to the state level. Um, we do some quality checks on it, then we bring in some federal stuff such as Forest Service roads, et cetera, and then we push the stuff up to the NSDI, uh, the National Spatial Data Infrastructures, particularly um, the address points to the NAD, and now we're starting to do parcels. And then it's almost back to the locals again, right? They get base maps, they get geocoders, they get services out of this too, and the cycle just keeps going. OSM, I have this in a little bit of a lighter color because this is the piece we want to start pulling in more, again, with those layers. We want to start pushing authoritative da data into uh, OpenStreetMap and, and, and pulling from it and having that more part of the data flow cycle. I'm getting the zero here that my time is out, so I'm going to skip this last slide. And say, last thing I want to say is thanks for listening and enjoy the conference. All right, don't everyone <laughs> rush at Greg at once when we break, but definitely um, I'm sure you'll take some questions later. <laughs> Thank you so much.